Faith in Gold is provided by Continental Diamond, Canterbury Park, JTR Roofing, and Faith Family Church. Here's the host of Faith and Goal, the voice of the Minnesota Vikings, Paul Allen. Wonderful, wonderful wild card weekend. How about those Buccaneers and Chiefs? Sauntered to a certain degree during the regular season, but now it's go time. And those past champs, they know how to put the pedal to the metal. That was fun to watch. They dominated Pennsylvania in a way two more L's needed to be added to the state's name. Now the one seeds get their crack at the action. The Tennessee Titans from the AFC, their offensive coordinator is Eden Prairie native Todd Downing. Let's go, Todd. In fact, in 2002, my first year calling Minnesota Vikings games, Todd was Coach Mike Tice's right-hand man and one of my very first friends and still best friends from the NFL. From the NFC, well, it's the old Green Bay Packers. The dreaded Packers to some, the respected Packers to others. Wayne Larravee has been their radio play-by-play voice for 23 years. His calls are clean and dramatic and creative and theatrical. For my taste, he's the best and most descriptive team radio guy of all 32 of us. Take a listen. You talk about roadkill, somebody better call the DNR because there's tons of it all over (laughs) Lambeau Field. And the driver, (laughs) the driver is A.J. Dillon. Wayne has done play-by-play in the NFL for 44 years, seven with the Kansas City Chiefs, 14 with the Chicago Bears, and 23 with the Green Bay Packers. He was the radio voice of the famous 85 Bears and their Super Bowl win over the Patriots, and also called Chicago Bulls games for WGN-TV, and during five Air Jordan-led NBA title seasons. What a blessed run for the man I call the dagger. And there is your dagger! It's Faith and Goal 14, and on this episode, we will discuss with the dagger, among other things, how he got his start almost a half century ago from the rafters at Boston Garden. Play-by-play on radio compared to TV, how he handled the vitriol he faced when leaving the Chicago Bears for the rival Green Bay Packers. And what it means when he says the job switch was a spiritual decision for him. It's Faith in Goal 14, The Dagger. And it starts now. Faith and Goal. Big game at Lambeau, Dagger. Uh, How imposing are these 49ers? You know, they look like a team that's, um, oh, got just a, a little bit of that stardust in them. You know, they had to come from behind. They had to beat the Rams the last week of the regular season. They got that done. Uh, and they went to Dallas and, and beat a very good Cowboys team. And although the final score looked fairly close, they kind of they controlled that game, I thought, pretty much throughout. This is a real good team, a real physical team. And what they do well, uh, PA, you know, will travel in bad weather. Okay, they run the football. They stop the run. They're physical in the trenches. When, when you say bad weather, I mean, if, if it's like zero on the wind chill or whatever, but there's not much wind or, say, snow or rain, um, it, it is truly how difficult is it to move the ball consistently in the postseason in those conditions? Well, the coaches all say they can account for um, snow, rain, uh, and cold. But what they can't do anything about is the wind. Uh, the wind affects how much you can throw the football, where you can throw it, how deep you can throw it, that kind of thing. So wind is the factor they worry about more than anything else. But um, I, the elements, I think the Packers are used to it, but uh, uh, the 49ers are the kind of team. It's not like the Rams are coming in here for this. Uh, the 49ers, they can uh, they can play in bad weather and have many times. Wayne, uh, not just uh, the playoffs a couple of years ago when the Niners ran for 284 and four TDs on the green and gold, but overall, in your opinion, what makes their offense tricky and Kyle Shanahan so well-respected as an offensive mind? Yeah, you know, um, that 49ers team, you know, has – they can do a lot of different things, give you a lot of different looks. Um, 
Debo Samuel, I think, is the guy. He's kind of the wild card. Um, you know, he's not a gadget guy. Uh, they run the football with him as a running back. He is seen as a running back. And I think the Packers have to um, look at him and respect him as a threat, as a running back, as well as a great wide receiver. So uh, the different things they can do that Shanahan does, the people he moves in motion, the eye candy he gives you prior to the snap, all of that comes into play. But he's got a, a skilled athlete in Debo Samuel. He can use like a chess piece. And that's the thing that I think sets them apart. But the one thing they'll do, they'll run the football, uh, PA. They run it 29 times a game on average. That ranks fifth overall in the league, fifth most. And um, they, they will not allow this game to get into the hands of Jimmy Garoppolo to win or lose this game. They, they will, that will not happen. Now, now you guys beat them in September, as you know. Um, uh, how much different are things with the Niners and the Packers from that time of the season to now the divisional round? Uh, how much? How different are things for each team? You know, it's funny because I, I believe teams evolve each season over the course of a season. And when you start the season, it's kind of like being in the infancy of life. You know, you're just you're a kid. You're just trying to figure out what you're doing the first three or four weeks of the season. Most teams are trying to figure out who they are, what their personality will be, what they're going to do. Uh, back in week three of the season, the Niners came in 2-0, and and they were th- feeling like, hey, we got, we're back to where we were in 2019. We're going to, you know, we're going to storm our way to the Super Bowl type of thing. Meanwhile, the Packers were coming in off 1-1, uh, and really questionable because um, of all the controversy during the offseason. They get beat 38-3 to the first week of the regular season by New Orleans. Uh, they kind of get a win, a nice win over Detroit, but they were trailing 14 to seven at halftime in that game to a bad Lions team. And and then you know these two teams meet in Santa Clara, and the Packers jump out big. The Niners come back, take the lead, and then the Packers get into position. Uh, Rodgers, with 37 seconds to go, was able to get them into field goal range, and Mason Crosby hit the game-winning kick. It was at that point that the Packers started to feel okay. These are the things we have to do. This is where we're starting to come together as a team. At that point, for the 49ers, that loss led to three more, and they were stumbling at midseason. And so uh, they've evolved from there, and I think these two teams are different in that the 49ers know how to operate their offense, how their running game is going to operate. Um, and the Packers, on the other hand, they've learned, hey, we're going to, we can survive all these injuries we've had, and we can win uh, with these guys. Faith and goal. Now, while getting ready for this playoff game or pondering the the opportunity to go to SoFi and play for Super Bowl 56, Wayne, do, do you, in the back of your mind, do you believe any game could be Aaron Rodgers' last wearing the green and gold? You know, we try not to focus on that, but human nature says you do. Um, and, yeah, I mean, you look at any of these games, it could be the last one game for Aaron Rodgers in green and gold. You hope not, but you're trying not to focus on that. I think the players and the team has done a good job of staying in the moment and and understanding that, as they quote said, and Rodgers and and Devontae Adams took up the the, uh, phrase, uh, last dance, um, they're trying to just enjoy the last dance and not worry about what's down the road because, um, you know, it's funny. It's kind of mirrors life. I mean, we all – uh, either lament or rejoice over the past, and there's really nothing we can do to change it. Obviously, it's already happened. We uh, worry and are concerned about what we don't know is going to happen in the future, and all we have is the present, and that's where this team is. In the present, they feel like they can make a run at this thing, and and uh, they're trying to enjoy this, uh, this last dance, if in fact it is. Um, the salary cap tells you it will be, but... Um, They're trying to stay in the moment. More with Wayne Larravee. It is Faith and Goal, Episode 14. More with the dagger around the corner, but first. Canterbury Park and CanterburyPark.com. Why don't you go to that website? I mean, you got the obvious there. Fun and games like no place else, 24-7 for the card casino. But uh, the Minnesota Home Show is Saturday, January 22nd, from 10 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. The home show is incredibly popular if you're looking for ways to amplify your home. It's at Canterbury Park, January 22nd, from 10 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. 
and it's canterburypark.com. We also thank Faith Family Church, Burnsville and Rosemount. It's my church. We are doing a series now called From the Ashes. It's fantastic. And we'd love you to join us sometime. FaithFamilyMN.org, services Saturday at 4.30 in Burnsville and 10 a.m. Sundays in Rosemount. Once again, FaithFamilyMN.org. Wisconsin with the Bucks, the champions, and football Americana Lambeau Field and the Green Bay Packers. The adoration, dedication, desperation, and love for the Green Bay Packers. You know, I'm, I'm privileged to see it just once a year when the Vikings come and play Green Bay. H- how would you describe the Packers fan base? Passionate. Um, as you mentioned, passionate, um, supportive. But here's the other thing that's interesting about Packers fans, Paul. Um, they are pretty tuned into what's going on. and they, they understand the game and how it's played. And in that regard, I would say in some respects they're like this. They're very supportive, but they're also um, critical. And they, they understand it's all not 100%. They're worried about their team. They understand it doesn't have everything. Uh, it, you know, no team is perfect, and they understand that. I think, like many fan bases, they dwell on the negative maybe a little bit. But for the most part, it's um, very supportive. And if someone from the outside comes in and starts talking negative about their team, the Packers, that's when they get really upset. Well explained. As we as we mentioned to top Faith and Goal 14, 44 years doing play-by-play in the NFL. Chiefs, Bears, 23 with Green Bay, WGN uh, TV with the Bulls, the origin, of and, and there's your dagger with Michael Jordan, beating teams, Big Ten Network, TV. You, you have done radio and television play-by-play. Which do you prefer and why? Uh, I prefer the radio because um, I'm painting the picture. Uh, on television, I'm just framing it. And and really, television is analyst-driven. Uh, radio is play-by-play driven. And uh, I think the easier of the two is radio because you're in command of the broadcast and where it's going. When you're doing television, you're just kind of a – as a play-by-play guy, you're basically framing the picture with words that people can see – and you're kind of the conduit to get uh, get get you from one element, be it a commercial break or a replay or something else, another feature that's coming up. You're basically a conduit more on television. It's interesting, Paul, because I would do TV on Saturdays and radio on Sundays, and I was more mentally exhausted uh, following a game on Saturday on TV game than I was on a Sunday afternoon game. Uh, more mentally exhausted because you have so many people you're involved with, You've got a producer and a director talking to you constantly uh, in your ear during a telecast, that type of thing. You've got to follow what the cameras are showing you. Uh, There's a lot of things involved with television uh, that whereas when you get to radio, it's almost like, okay, now I can just breathe. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. It's it's up to me just to paint the picture. Amen. I think TV is, is absolutely harder than radio, even though you're saying less. I mean, I think you laid that out beautifully. Now, you know, yours truly, I, I laid in bed many a night in the 80s, Wayne, listening to Vin Scully and Chick Hearn call games. And I knew then, specifically with Chick and the Lakers, what I wanted to do. For for you, it was Marv Albert on the radio. How, how impactful was that for you in crafting this dream career? It was pretty impactful when you think back on it, in, in that it was the inspiration uh, the way he called the Knicks games and the Rangers and later on the Giants. Um, and, yeah, I would say it was very impactful, Paul, because I, I did start to model what I was doing off of him. And then eventually you've got to start um, finding your own footing and in, in your own way of doing it, that kind of thing. But, no, I would say uh, that was the inspiration for me, the way he called the Knicks games especially in the early 70s. Uh, that inspired me. Have you ever slipped on a Mason Crosby extra point or field goal and wanted to say, Huss, and it counts? <laughs> no, not quite, but I've I've missed on, you know, some of those field goals or extra points are hard to see sometimes, and I have 
flubbed up one or two of those over the years, that's for sure. Yeah, Marv had staples and uh, a distinct voice and a unique style, and it was it was all his own. And those are some major, major keys to succeeding in what we do. And, you know, for you, Dagger, tell us about your formative years and calling games into a tape recorder from the rafters of the Boston Garden. Yeah, I mean, that couldn't happen today because the rafters are now where the skyboxes are. And so, (laughs) no, but, you know, in the old Boston Garden, NBA is done basically on the floor and in the old Boston Garden. It was done on the second level. There was a third level to the garden, and that was where the hockey booths were. Well, I would go into the basketball games and get into the uh, hockey booths. I mean, security isn't what it wasn't then what it is today. And I'd get up there with my tape recorder, and I'd uh, do the game um, basically alone, and it was great. It was great training and experience. Every time I was, uh, you know, when I was in college at Emerson College, it was downtown. I'd walk over to the Boston Garden and, and, um, you know, attend the Celtics game and broadcast it into my tape recorder, bring it back to the dorm, uh, kind of listen to it and critique it, that type of thing. And, and it was great. It, I really, it, it allowed me to kind of almost imagine that I was living this career type of thing. That's how I did it. It was almost like this was my job. I had to do this every night the Celtics were playing. When, when young aspiring broadcasters, those in high school, in college, whatever, when, when they approach you and they ask you, what are some keys to succeeding in the world of broadcasting, specifically play-by-play, what do you tell them? Well, I, I tell them to be, be patient and versatile. Um, in today's game, you know, I, my career path was pretty clear-cut. I felt like I grew up on the East Coast. I felt like I'd have to go to the Midwest. Um, you know, work my way up the ladder, that type of thing. I felt that's where the opportunities were. Um, and on the lower levels, like high school, I mean, high school sports was bigger in the Midwest. It was bigger in the panhandle of Texas than it was back on the East Coast where I grew up. And that's where, you know, that's what I did. But today, um, a lot of these guys, sure, you've got to work at your craft a little bit and you can practice in front of a TV and everything like that. But you got to be willing to go into a radio or television station and be part of the crew. I mean, maybe you're running a camera. Maybe you're producing a talk show. Then you get on the air a little bit, and you kind of work your way in that way. Meantime, you do what you can to, to get some play-by-play here and there, maybe on, on a high school game or something like that. Um, but it, it's, it's not easy, and there are a lot of people trying to do it, Paul, as you know. And I don't know if the opportunities are there that I had, for example. Um, let me just give you one example, and that would be when I left college, I had some professional experience with, uh, on my resume. I had done some games on local uh, tele, uh, radio stations in, uh, in Berkshire, Massachusetts, in, in the Berkshires. Uh, I had also taken a semester out of college and gone to Pampa, Texas, and did Friday Night Lights. Um, my first job out of college, when I finally went back to school and finished up and then had a, an opportunity, was doing the Iowa football games on KSTT Radio in Davenport, Iowa. And how did I get that opportunity? Well, back in those days, instead of having the big networks doing, you know, covering the entire state, all these schools in the Big Ten had different stations uh, from different markets coming in. And Iowa had 13 originations of their games every Saturday. And I happened to hook on and get one of those. And and that was was big for me. Now, in in 2011... Wayne, you were quoted in the Chicago Tribune saying your reason for leaving the Chicago Bears to call Green Bay Packers games was, quote, a spiritual decision. What does that mean? (laughs) Did I really say that? Well, I guess I did. Um, To me, see, I grew up, Paul, I had two favorite teams when I was a kid, the New York Yankees and the Green Bay Packers. And I grew up in the 60s, so obviously those teams when I was six, seven, eight years old, those were teams that were on top at the time. But I but I loved the interlocked NY on the pinstripe uniform of the Yankees, and I loved the uh, G on the side of the helmet of the Packers. And my favorite colors as a kid were green and gold, and, and that just sold me. So it helped that those teams were good at the time, and they had uh, incredible people uh, on them, Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford and Roger Maris and all those guys of the Yankees. And, and of course, uh, Bart Starr and Paul Horning and, and uh, Jerry Kramer, all those guys are the Packers. But um, that I always said in, all along, I said, you know, depending on how my career evolves, 
Uh, I, if the Yankees, if I ever had a chance to do the Yankees or the Packers, I would I would have to jump at it. And so that had, as my career evolved into football, that had always been when I was in Kansas City. That was always my intention that hey, if the Packers job ever opened up, I was certainly going to apply for it. And I don't care what I'm doing at that time. Bears Packers, obviously one of the great rivalries in the history of the NFL, and you know it, it's fact from from studying on it and talking to you that there was sports related anger aimed at you when you switched from the Bears to the Packers. Where where did that angst mostly come from, and how did you handle it? Well, it was interesting because I was still doing a lot of work in Chicago. I was still doing the Bulls, and I was still doing Big Ten stuff, and. Um, you know, a lot of it, it was from the Bears fan base, and un- understandably so in, in retrospect. But um, you know what was interesting? I don't know if – see, back then in 1999, we didn't have social media the way we have it today. Sports social media was the sports talk shows. And there were three stations that had, you know, were doing uh, sports talk at the time in Chicago. So that's where a lot of that came from. But, um, you know, the one thing, then when people would see me, Chicago sports fans, uh, very personal, their announcers, and I didn't realize this, become really um, personal to them. Uh, you know, certainly the players are and, and that type of thing, and the coaches, but the announcers in Chicago are very um, closely watched and, and uh, embraced. And I didn't realize that at the time. So that's where I felt whenever I'd go somewhere in Chicago, and I was still living there for a while, um, you know, people would, would come up to me and say things to me and, you know, like, uh, hey, hated to see you go or you should never have left the Bears or so, things like that. Usually it was pretty, um, pretty nice. But, um, you know, I didn't realize that. And here I was talking to the guy who hired me 23 years ago. And he and I had discussed this as, you know, we were ramping up to get this thing done. He said, you know, I said to him, you know, I don't think today we could have pulled that off. I don't think when, you know, with the social media the way it is today, that would have worked um, for the team or for the radio station. So um, it might never might never happen again like that. Well, with, with, with play-by-play guys, radio or TV in Chicago becoming one with the fan, is there a greater example in any market than Harry Carey? No, no, and, and there is no greater sports market, in my opinion. And I'm from the East Coast now, so I'm not given to this. Um, uh, there's no greater sports market than Chicago. Uh, passionate, following their teams. Um, you know, you have the pocket of fans that follow the Blackhawks. You've got Bulls fans in the winter. You have uh, Cubs fans on the north side, White Sox fans on the south side, and the Bears engulf everyone. And that's why they're the biggest team in town. Uh, and finally, with Faith and Goal, uh, the 14 pod featuring Wayne Larravee, the dagger, um, you, you are Catholic and rarely, if ever, miss a Sunday at church. H- how would you define your relationship with God and how important is it to you? Very interesting question, Paul, in that um, God is a part of my every waking hour. Um, you know, I'm aware. <laughs> Uh, whether I'm happy, angry, whatever. But most of it is and when I sit down and reflect on my life, uh, you know, especially recently, I, I've just been saying, wow, thank you. And I don't know what I can do. And, uh, you know, I've already blown 67 years or 66 years here now. I don't know what I can do in the remaining years I have left to make it up uh, to God for uh, the, the blessings that he's bestowed upon me. I, I grew up with um, two wonderful parents. Uh, two sisters, two younger sisters, in an idyllic place. Google Berkshire County, Western Massachusetts. It's a beautiful little small-town place up in the Berkshire Hills. I went to college in Boston, exactly what I needed to do. I had to get out of the country and go to the city to uh, learn how to live that life. And I I made great friends at Emerson. I got great breaks as I came along. Um, At 22 years old or thereabouts, or 23, I was you know, got the job in Kansas City. These are all blessings from God. And and then the people he put into my life, you know, my wife, Julie, uh, my two kids, um, uh, Scott and Brian. And then most recently, you know, five years ago, um, almost five years ago, uh, we have a grandson. And so the blessings that um, God has bestowed upon me, I almost feel guilty about, to be honest with you. Maybe that's a little of the, the Catholic aspect of it. But uh, I'm so appreciative for what, um, uh, number one, I've come to understand that life itself is to be appreciated, okay? 
whether it's hard or whether it's easy, whether it's joyous, whether it's um, filled with angst, it, this is an opportunity. This opportunity is um, to be appreciated. And the, the other thing about it, it's a blink of an eye. I don't care if you look to be 100 years old. In the context of eternity, this life is a blink of an eye. And, you know, that's, uh, that's how I feel about it. I, I just, God has been so good to me. It's, it, it's um, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I just can't make it up to him. That's one of the most beautiful answers we, we've had through all 14 episodes of Faith and Goal. And, you know, it, it's from a professional blessing standpoint, nuance related as it is. You, you've had Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers as your quarterback for almost every single one of your calls. <laughs> Are you kidding me with that blessing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I also had, you know, I also had some uh, bad teams in Kansas City, and uh, I had the Wanstead years in Chicago. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, Wayne, it all comes out even in the end. <laughs> Wayne, um, I am privileged to call you friend. Um, our conversations off the radio are my favorite. Hopefully they're yours. And um, absolutely. Th- thank you very much for joining Faith and Goal. Best of luck to your squad uh, this playoff run. And uh, God bless you, Wayne. And, and have a wonderful day, okay? All the best, PA. Thank you. A plus. Th- thanks a lot, Wayne. Hey, thank you, Paul. Talk to you soon. Keep in touch. Yep, got you, bud. Bye. Thank you. What a talent and what a career with which God has blessed Wayne Larravee. Faith and goal. Daggered the Pats in Super Bowl Twenty. He was on the call. Created the dagger call thanks to Michael Jordan beating teams at the buzzer. Called the Packers winning the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 45, over Pittsburgh. Well done, young dagger. Well done, Wayne Larravee. Also, well done, JTR Roofing. Thank you for the sponsorship. Roof with JTR.com. It is uh, 2022, and we are approaching spring, so make plans with JTR Roofing, not only for roofing, but for siding, for windows. Just go to the website, and if you get the opportunity, even if you don't make a move with JTR Roofing, just thank them for being part of the core four founding fathers of sponsorship for the inaugural run of Faith and Goal. Roof with JTR.com. Also, Continental Diamond in St. Louis Park, Jimmy Pessis. Uh, That's a quarter century best friend of yours truly. And whenever yours truly has an adventure, a journey, a venture, an avocation, a vocation, there's Jimmy. Uh, One of the, if not the most loyal human beings I've ever met in my life. And that comes back to you, the jewelry buying customer, When you are making a jewelry purchase, I ain't kidding you with this. Go ahead and prove me wrong. Only one place to do it so you can get treated fairly, you can save money, and get the best customer service from the most loving people you'll ever meet. It is Continental Diamond and ContinentalDiamond.com. There's so much adoration, respect, and love for Wayne Larravee from yours truly at least, and I would imagine a bunch in the Green Bay Packers fan base. This week's deep stretch scripture hones in on the word love. The Apostle Paul was preaching to the Church of Corinth, which at the time, Corinth was a chief city in Greece for trade and politics. In sharing the good news of the gospel, we head to 1 Corinthians in the New Testament And a powerful reminder, yet very relatable today, regarding the word love and what goes into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the way of love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge... And if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its way. 
It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So true. Hopefully that passage tugs at the love in your hearts and you take it out into the world and by example and in having internal peace in all situations, you walk the walk of righteousness and in honor of the sovereignty of God. Faith in Goal 14 is complete. And there is your dagger! For producer Eric Nordquist, I'm Paul Allen. Thank you very much for listening. Have a wonderful day.